Bon après-midi. Bon après-midi, bonjour à tous. Bonjour à tous. So, Vladimir Zakharov, you are applying to the degree of uh, habilitation à diriger des recherches. And so, for that purpose, you have presented a written document with title Mathematical Simulation of a Dusty Gas Atmosphere of a Comet. So, you will have uh, this, this document has been uh, read and approved by three reviewers that have given favorable advice for. Uh, the oral defense, so you have now the opportunity to present your work, and then we'll have uh, some discussion with all the committee members. So before you start, let me just introduce the committee members. So we have first in line uh, Mike Combi from the uh, University of Michigan. Hello, Mike. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, then, uh, okay, we'll just go by row. So Paul Hartog from uh, Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research. Uh, somehow, Tundi for University of the Park in Napoli, right? Uh, Jessica Agarwal from Braunschweig University, Dominique Boclet from Paris Observatory, Francois Leblanc for Latmos, not far from Paris, uh, and Nick Thomas from University of Bern, and myself, Emmanuel Rebouf from Paris Observatory. So, Vladimir, you have the floor. Je vous présente le tour en travail sur la chaîne mathématique de notre pastel de gaz au sol, qui nous permet de soutenir la délégation à l'étude de recherche. Une grande partie de mon travail s'est déroulée dans le contexte de coopération internationale et dans plusieurs centres de recherche internationale euh, situés dans différents pays. La composition de ces jurys est également internationale. C'est pourquoi, afin d'être compréhensible pour tout, je vais poursuivre ma présentation en anglais. Euh, this is subtitles. <laughs> So, brief uh, uh, summary of my brief biography. So, I um, graduated from Baltic State Technical University in St. Petersburg in 1997. Then, I got a PhD degree from uh, St. Petersburg Technical University in uh, mechanics of gas with the plasma. Uh, in, uh, during my thesis, I specialized in uh, direct simulation Monte Carlo method. Uh, and this method is um, a tool for normally for uh, studying verified non equilibrium gas flows. I started working on comets uh, since 2001 when I was invited by Dr. Jean-François Griffot from at the time from Soviet Germany uh, to develop a kinetic model of commentary atmosphere. So since 2001, I'm primarily working on comics. Uh, what comics are? Uh, so, comets uh, are thought to be leftovers of uh, planet formation or uh, direct uh, or simply planet isthmus or their uh, descendant. Uh, specific features of this object that uh, they, uh, uh, although they uh, have permanent uh, relation of their surface layer, but uh, in uh, uh, they in principle, experience very few global changes. And that's why it is thought that they uh, can keep information about early solar system, about uh, primitive materials of the solar system, and uh, can tell a story about uh, formation of planets. Uh, studying of, of comets, uh, uh, to study a comet in a good resolution, we have to send uh, spacecraft in the, to the, in the vicinity of these objects. And uh, to our date, uh, there are only six or seven comets visited from uh, close, uh, observed from the global distance. Uh, they are shown on the slide, and uh, this 
know that uh, when I start working on uh, simulation of cometary atmospheres, it was 2001, only actually one comet, Halley, was observed from close distance. All others uh, were observed when I already started working. So, uh, the Rosetta mission uh, was launched in 2004 and arrived to the comet in 2014. And uh, I uh, participated in this mission as well since uh, 2011 as a part of the JANA instrument. The goals of Rosetta mission was uh, rendezvous with the comet then escorting this comet for several months on its way around the sun uh, and studying uh, gas and dust atmosphere with uh, different plasma also with different instruments in situ and uh, remote. The Rosetta spacecraft uh, consists of Rosetta orbit itself plus uh, a lander phili. Among instruments uh, on Rosetta spacecraft, uh, I would like to mention uh, just a few which uh, I used in uh, my studies. It's uh, optical spectrometric and infrared uh, uh, remote imaging system Azuris, microwave instrument for Rosetta orbit and Miro, Rosetta orbital spectrometer for ion and neutral analysis Rosina, and a brain impact analyzer and dust accumulator Jada. There were uh, several other instruments, but uh, uh, with this, I interact um, most. After the mission, it was uh, found that the uh, surface of a short period comet was too processed, and uh, there, is a, uh, there was an idea to send a new mission to a comet which uh, is less processed. Uh, and probably uh, for the first time come in the solar system. So uh, Comet Interceptor mission was um, selected by ESA in 2019, and it will be launched uh, in 2029. This is a multi-spacecraft mission, which uh, consists of uh, one mother um, main spacecraft, which carries two small Spacecrafts which will be released uh, at the moment when it will uh, fly by the comet, the target comet. As a primary goal of this mission is characterization of long period comet, preferably dynamically new or interstellar. Uh, well, this mission has a specific feature that uh, target comet is unknown yet. That's why the spacecraft should be ready. Uh, the um, construction of the spacecraft uh, should take into account that the uh, object can be uh, different. And also, uh, this object should be found uh, well in advance to be able to point the spacecraft to this object. So, uh, the, the, if any uh, way to interpret observations of uh, the instrument from the spacecraft in already in the coma, or to prepare future missions. It is uh, necessary to estimate parameters of gas and dust environment of the comet. And this can be done only with, uh, by the means of numerical simulation. That's why the subject of my research is the development of a complex uh, numerical model of dusty gas environment of the comet. And uh, this uh, model should uh, work in a, uh, this should solve one, problem, one task. We know some um, shape of the nucleus with activity and uh, the model should predict parameters of the atmosphere or the environment of this model. And vice versa. We know some information about uh, the coma and we should derive from these parameters of the nucleus. <coughs> That's why in my studies I focus mostly on the inner coma. Uh, 
uh, which is a steel nitron. And uh, where uh, gas still accelerates, uh, well, in addition to uh, dust and gas uh, uh, models, uh, models, I include in my studies radiative transformer gamma because uh, observation of, of water by spectrometers could uh, bring a lot of useful information. And in addition, this is a good example of how uh, gas and dust model of the coma could be uh, applied uh, for uh, derivation of uh, parameters uh, from observation made by uh, spectrometers. So what is uh, what gas coma is? Uh, so the characteristic features of gas coma is that it is uh, first multi-species. Uh, since expansion, uh, since uh, products of sublimation of ices expand in, our, uh, in practically in vacuum, the flow becomes supersonic very fast. And uh, again, since this object is small and the uh, sublimation expands in practically in universe, uh, flow becomes rarefied very soon. These are characteristic features of uh, cometary flow. Uh, the, uh, Coma structure could be uh, additionally divided into two parts. Uh, coma with fine structure and coma uh, in a large scale. Uh, large scale features, uh, they uh, tell us about total reaction rate, asymmetry of uh, emission, uh, and small um, scale or fine uh, structures in the coma can tell us about uh, morphology of the surface, the majority of the, majority of the surface, so about local features of uh, surface activity. So, I said previously, um, uh, shows challenges to, uh, so uh, the fact that uh, flow is supersonic, Rarified non equilibrium, this uh, makes challenges for numerical simulations because a lot of uh, numerical methods uh, operate only with equilibrium conditions. So, uh, in, my, in my studies, I use uh, two kinds of methods actually, which covers uh, all possible conditions gas dynamical simulations. Uh, which assume uh, solution of partial differential equations and uh, gas kinetic methods, particle based like direction relation Monte Carlo. In uh, addition, uh, on the way to develop complex uh, model of the coma, I considered also a number of simplified pedagogical cases, uh, which uh, shows uh, more clearly a different. Uh, features of the uh, flows in the coma. Uh, for example, this slide shows uh, one of these pedagogical cases uh, where I compare uh, structure of the flow from spherical nucleus with uh, less active uh, band around the axis of evolution and uh, of the same size as spherical object but homogeneous with a cavity which uh, they are shown on the uh, figure on the right and as you can see on the distribution of density uh, these two uh, nucleus shows very uh, close uh, structure and from that we can conclude that just uh, simply by visual, uh, by eye, we are not able to distinguish uh, what was the reason of these uh, structures. It's inhomogeneity of the surface or asphericity, geometrical factor or morphology. Uh, so uh, the same kind of uh, studies were done for a few other uh, simplified objects like a spherical object with less active uh, cap and uh, spherical, uh, spherical object with a big uh, fully sunlit cavity 
For instance, another simplified uh, case, uh, we have a homogeneous nucleus with fully summit cavity, and depending on uh, distance to the sun, we can have a very different uh, flow structure inside the cavity. For instance, on the uh, picture on the right, uh, on the, no, it's me. So when uh, flux from the surface is very strong, it can close the cavity and all gas which uh, sublimates or emitted from the surface inside the cavity can't live in the outer space. It recondenses back. But when, uh, for the same geometry, when uh, the flux uh, decreases, so we see very simple outflow from this cavity in outer space. And uh, this demonstrates uh, that um, variation of coma structure is uh, not linear and it can't be interpolated between uh, uh, different uh, situations. So this kind of things could be predicted only by uh, means of uh, other complex numerical simulations. Uh, well, uh, now about uh, Rosetta again. Because um, CNES uh, organization responsible uh, for development and uh, for descending of uh, TLI on the surface, uh, they uh, requested uh, for the model of uh, gas environment to estimate aerodynamic forces on the lander. And this uh, work was delegated to the group of uh, scientists led by uh, Jean Francois Griffon. From our centers with the Ranomi. Uh, and uh, he invited uh, Regionov and me to this group. And in this group, I was responsible for the development of the kinetic approach because Regionov uh, did a fluid approach. And uh, with kinetic and fluid approach, we can cover all possible conditions. It's uh, important to note specification uh, for lander descent. First, uh, this descent should be uh, rather far from the sun uh, in order not to get a strong uh, aerodynamic force, which prevents lander from landing because it doesn't have bricks. Then, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this landing is quite a long procedure. It takes a few hours at least. Then, uh, uh, velocity of the lander should be uh, not, not more than 1.2 meter per second. And uh, also, uh, there are a lot of constraints on the uh, surface uh, of landing, inclination, illumination, and so on. So uh, this I uh, mentioned only to show that uh, it was really necessary to make a good prediction uh, to make landing uh, successful. So uh, for this work, we got a shape model. Uh, it's shown here on the top. Uh, from this shape, we uh, degraded uh, to our effective surface model. And uh, this shape we used for further uh, work. Uh, the model of gas production from the nucleus was semi-analytical. Uh, I do not want to give all, to talk a lot about this equation. It's just to show that uh, they are uh, really uh, analytical in the sense that uh, gas production depends on the position of the sun, but uh, it contains some uh, factors, uh, some um, which you can adjust. Uh, they are shown here by small f. So uh, the goal of our work was to get observational data and adjust these factors to get the best fit observational data. So uh, this slide shows an example of uh, velocity and density uh, around uh, this nucleus for some uh, instant. And uh, the picture below shows the trajectory of Rosetta. 
uh, which uh, measured in situ density, for which we later made a graffiti. So finally, uh, after the workshop, we arrived to this kind of distribution of uh, homogeneity factors shown on the top. And with this kind of uh, homogeneity factors, uh, we can fit rather well uh, the relative abundances of uh, water, CO and CO2, in a short period and in a rather long period. For instance, here to the left, we have a period of uh, 45 days and uh, on the right, only four days. And in both cases, fitting is uh, rather good. And also, uh, this is a total density. Again, a red uh, line is observational data and green is uh, model predictions. So again, on a long, on a long time scale and a short period, we have rather good agreement. Of course, uh, sometimes it's not so good, but uh, well, that's uh, the best what we can do. So, uh, uh, one of the difficult, the most difficult part of this work is that we were very limited in time. The first observational data we got in the middle of August, and the last model delivery to CNES, we had uh, provided at the end of October. Uh, because after that, uh, they were not able to adapt our data. So, uh, as a result, in November 12, 2014, there was the first successful landing of the spacecraft on the planet. So, now uh, the task for one. First of all, I have to say that uh, this, uh, even uh, the task is uh, much less. Uh, Clear object than uh, the gas molecules because molecules we can st we study in uh, laboratories they are well known with their properties. Uh, as for the dust, uh, there are also two identity grains, and uh, there are a lot of. Uh, so, uh, and first of all, uh, also it's not clear what we call dust. In principle, in the context of my work, I call dust everything which uh, every object which has a solid phase. So, uh, also, uh, for mathematical simulation of dust coma, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, uh, several main is uh, that um, dust flows have a very different time scales with respect to the gas flows. Uh, and uh, also, time evolution of grains uh, has a very different uh, time scale. Uh, with respect to gas flows. And uh, it means that when we make simulation of gas and dust, uh, we can advance in gas uh, with uh, large steps, in the dust, uh, we have to advance in very small steps. And this is really a difficult problem for numerical simulation. In the case of dust coma, like it was done with the gas coma, we consider uh, a lot of pedagogical cases just to understand better uh, the physics of uh, the animal environment. So this uh, slide shows example of uh, homogeneous aspheric molecules with uh, cavity, uh, partially solid. And uh, on the top, this is the density of gas. And uh, on the bottom, density of uh, uh, very small dust and a four centimeter size grain. Uh, so uh, these exercises allowed us to conclude that uh, in general the dust uh, structures uh, do not have very clear uh, connection with gas coma structures. Only probably for very very fine dust. Then. Uh, it was found that uh, dust fall back on the surface is a very uh, general process. And um, 
in context of mathematical simulation for method like uh, multi fluid method. This makes a specific uh, problem. Uh, this method does not work uh, when uh, grains uh, return back or uh, there is a trajectory crossing. So uh, I developed my own uh, method of what uh, we call dust Monte Carlo uh, to make this kind of uh, to make this kind of simulations. This slide just shows uh, the result of uh, our work. This is a time dependent so dimensional uh, dust uh, coma for uh, submicron grains and for millimeter sized grains. And uh, as you can see, uh, they have very little in common. But this is the same uh, gas uh, coma, but dust. Uh, small and large dust, they move very, very different. So, another part. This slide is uh, too not scared. It is uh, especially made for that. Well, the uh, thing is that, uh, in principle, the dynamics of uh, a spherical particle can be written in a very uh, simple way. This is uh, simply uh, dynamics. But if we will find some uh, characteristic scales, and if we will do, uh, if we normalize all uh, our variables, we can arrive to equation in dimensionless form, which uh, contains a three, in this case, if we consider only aerodynamics, gravitational attraction of the nucleus, and solar pressure force, we have three characteristic uh, parameters, E, FU, and rho. Uh, so, uh, parameter E, this is the efficiency of environment of the particle within the gas flow, so how fast particle adapt to the variation of gas flow. Parameter FU, this is efficiency of gravitational attraction, uh, parameter rho, this is the contribution of solar radiation pressure. Also, if, for instance, uh, we include here also rotation of the nucleus, or we work in the frame rotating with the nucleus, then uh, will appear another parameter, uh, for instance, uh, which uh, uh, characterizes the influence of Coriolis force, of uh, centrifugal force. If we include in uh, uh, dynamics of the particle. Some other effects will appear some different criteria as well. So this list is not uh, complete. But why, uh, what it gives us? For instance, here, uh, right, there is uh, a table with parameters for three cases of uh, dust uh, coma. So you can see that number of parameters uh, is rather large in comparison of only three at the below. Then these three cases differ by size of the particle or mass of the particle or mass of the and size of the nucleus, but they all have the same uh, characteristic parameters, if and low. And the result is that we have absolutely identical uh, distribution of density and velocity. Slides to the right shows three, all these three cases, they're absolutely identical. It means that uh, there is no need to compute all three. You need to compute one, and then you can rescale it to practically an infinite number of uh, different uh, situations. So this is uh, this allows us to save time for simulation. Another part of this, another uh, good um, result from this. Instead of many parameters, we have only limited number for which we can uh, rather easily do parameter uh, search. For instance, here shown uh, uh, parameter, uh, studying parameter space of E and Fu, and it shows us the distance when a particle reach uh, terminal velocity. And you can see that uh, uh, there is a clear asymptotic value at about six uh, radius of the nucleus. 
And to the right, uh, uh, this is uh, terminal velocity of the last brain. So, uh, to get terminal velocity from some dust grain, there is no need to make complex simulation. It's sufficient just to compute uh, uh, algebraically parameter in, in full, and you can get uh, immediately a rather precise estimation of this grain. Uh, also, this um, asymptotics could be approximated. For instance, I found the approximation for terminal uh, velocity, it is shown here. Uh, as I said, we just need to compute uh, one calculator effect parameter E, and then we can get uh, the terminal velocity. The interesting part that uh, when this uh, approximation was derived, I think next day I found that it was already derived by uh, Krifo and Radionov in 1995, but from absolutely different considerations. <laughs> but uh, this just proves that uh, uh, this result is correct. Well, then for the comet interceptor, uh, it was necessary to assess uh, a dust hazard uh, with a spacecraft. Uh, for that analysis, uh, I developed a gas coma model, engineering gas coma model, because first to make dust simulation, we, we need to have some gas uh, distribution. So uh, this engineering gas coma model, uh, it contains a very limited number of parameters and uh, it describes very general properties of uh, the gas coma. So it is given by total production rate, size of the nucleus, the temperature in subsolar point, and the variation of surface activity. Uh, Dust dynamical model uh, assumes that particle are spherical and consider only three forces from the gas, attraction from the nucleus, gravitational attraction from the nucleus, and solar pressure force. Then, since the object for uh, the target object in comet interceptor is unknown, uh, we have uh, this uh, table of parameters, uh, which uh, also shows uh, how uncertain these parameters are. And to make a search in this uh, parameter space, it is very difficult, it takes a lot of time, but if we, as previously, convert all our dynamics in uh, dimensionless form, we have uh, three parameters, unfortunately also in some, uh, in rather large range, but at least this is treatable. And uh, that was my part of the book, I did these simulations, then uh, these results were provided to Raphael Marshall, who made some match. He uh, composed a dust coma, computed IFRO, and uh, checked if this IFRO fit in, uh, with the limits of, pos uh, prob of possible, impossible limits. And after that, uh, uh, we got uh, statistical dis uh, distribution of uh, possible cases of possible situations along trajectories of spacecraft in uh, of comet interceptor, uh, and uh, one of these uh, results shown here on the right. So this model, uh, of course, predict, uh, for instance, number of particles uh, in a very uh, is very large uncertainty. For instance, here you can see that this uncertainty is uh, sometimes several orders of magnitude, but uh, already this uh, is quite uh, sufficient for uh, constructing the shields, dark protecting shields for the space flight. So this model uh, already been used. So, well, now uh, about radiative transfer, uh, I developed uh, one-dimensional model of uh, rotational uh, lines of water, also water. Uh, this model uh, initially used a uh, very simple uh, gas distribution hazard model with some uh, small additions. And uh, 
Uh, Monte Carlo again, Monte Carlo model of radiative transfer. And uh, with this model, uh, we are able to compute synthetic profiles for water lines. And uh, here at the bottom, you can see examples of these um, synthetic profiles. Uh, well, after this work was done, uh, maybe one year later, Jacques Rivier showed me results of observations and comparison of observation with uh, model predictions. And as far as I remember, they were so close that practically on the uh, undistinguished. And I was really happy, but only for a few minutes. Because uh, after that, I realized that uh, the model so does is so simple. And if with this so simple model, we can already fit so good, but what was it about more complicated models? So that's why uh, I was happy, but not for a long time. But then uh, this uh, one dimensional model was extended in uh, 3D. More, more likely in this example, we have a three dimensional uh, gas coma, but uh, radiative transfer was um, in this particular example. LT uh, for uh, uh, derivation of excitation temperatures for level populations, and then uh, through radiative transfer for uh, uh, integration in the beam. And uh, you can see on the right uh, the map of uh, with spectrum, uh, and you can see easily the correlation between uh, density, uh, it is shown on the left. And uh, lines, uh, spectral lines, um, right. So uh, this work uh, was done uh, to estimate uh, the probability of Nero to measure water in uh, 67. Well, this is also this very simple example, just shows uh, how. Uh, Spectral lines arise uh, during rotation of the moon. And finally, uh, I developed now two uh, three dimensional relative transfer model, uh, which allow to compute relative transfer in the exosphere of cells. Actually, this work was uh, for me even more interesting because uh, first, I have to uh, compute the gas distribution in the atmosphere of CERES and then to make radiative transfer in this uh, gas environment. So, uh, this work was difficult, but the result uh, here you can see the blue line is the model predictions, red uh, crosses is observational, observational data. Uh, so, this for me looks good. And uh, on the right, there is a spectra, a red spectra, which is not very well visible here. It's a model prediction, of course, with some uh, scaling, additional scaling. But uh, well, uh, this uh, result shows that uh, uh, the model uh, developed fits quite well. So this is the end of science part. Also, uh, in my uh, uh, memoirs, I have forgotten to write about uh, my work with PG students. So uh, I was, uh, let's say, informally co-director of the uh, PhD thesis of Adeline GK uh, and of Insanity Group. Well, for uh, Adeline, I helped her with the development of time-dependent model simulating uh, the motion of ejecta uh, with uh, uh, supplementing grains. As I said previously, this is a rather complex problem due to very different uh, time scales, and uh, it's a really, really difficult problem. 
So she successfully finished her PhD in 2011. And then uh, I helped uh, with, some, with uh, modeling of radiative transfer in optical ASIC media. So uh, what I can say that uh, after working with uh, Vincent, finally I start to understand what I did before. <laughs> because the difference that Adeline believed in all my what I say, so I had to be very careful. And Vincent, he did not believe at all. And every time I had to find proofs why it is like that. So in conclusion, I can say that I learned a lot from them. So uh, the perspective of uh, this work that I did, uh, I, I hope I will be able to continue studying the dusty gas flows coupled uh, in both ways, dust, dust and uh, For the moment, what I showed you, it was uh, gas which carries dust, and dust does not affect the gas, which in many cases justifies, but uh, in reality, Dust does affect the gas flow. So uh, I then uh, to make this study. Then uh, also I plan to study uh, motion of dust with physical chemical uh, processes. Then uh, to develop more realistic models of uh, gas activity of the surface, which includes uh, multi dimensional time dependent thermal transfer. Heat transfer in, in addition to porous uh, layers. Then uh, I plan to consider the um, dust grains, uh, the model of dust grain detachment from the surface, ejection of grain from the surface, which is a very actual problem. And uh, also include here uh, model of surface erosion. Then uh, so I would like to continue working on uh, backward modeling. It means that uh, to develop uh, mod uh, not models, but uh, numerical procedures, uh, which allows to make a link between observations in uh, in-situ observations in the coma, for instance, and uh, parameters uh, on the surface. Uh, well, and of course, uh, uh, not the last in priority, but uh, in this list, to improve computational efficiency of my related transfer codes, because uh, this uh, is really necessary. Well, in general conclusion, I would like to say that uh, I inherit a large volume of uh, knowledge from my teachers, Professor Lukianov and uh, Jean Francois Grifo. Uh, you can see how much I got. Uh, it was in 2010, kind of that. And those who helped me to move this know that it's very heavy. And uh, now, after 20 years of work, the volume increased a lot. Now you can see it on the photo to the right. And I would like to pass it to the next generation of researchers. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you very much. So we now uh, start the Q&A session. So we start with the reviewers, and perhaps we start with Mike Combi. So Mike, you're there. Yeah, thanks for activating your camera and microphone. So you have the floor. You can start with making comments on what you think of the work and then ask any question. Well, the work, the work, the work that's been done is very impressive. Oh, I'm getting an echo of my power. So. <laughs> it's throwing me off. Really. Uh, in any case, I'm, I'm most interested in. Uh, I need to turn me down so I can't hear myself. For a second. Uh, I'm most interested in, in how you apply all of the various models, especially the, the, the limited parameter models, for how you anticipate doing this for comet interceptor. 
Uh, I assume Comet, the Comet will be identified many, many months, if, if there is one, an Oort cloud Comet, a dy dynamically new Comet, many months before the actual flyby yes. happens. And these comets are rather notorious for not being able to uh, predict what their total activity is going to be when they come in closer to the sun. In fact, I have seen your production rates, some of the smaller production rate ones uh, have been shown to, uh, to completely disintegrate by the time they get in closer to the sun. And what I wanted you to, what I'm asking you to do is just comment on uh, how you anticipate using the, the various levels of tools that you have as uh, the, uh, as, as common interceptor progresses from identifying the object many, many months ahead of time to deciding how close you want to go and what the hazard is actually going to be. Did you get that? Yeah, sorry. Okay, then, uh, yeah, it's, the, the, the sound is not perfect, so we, we missed some of your question. Uh, can you perhaps try to rephrase it a bit or repeat? Okay, okay I'll, I'll try to, I'll get closer, but I was uh, hearing myself echo back and it was hard to speak. Uh, what I want, wondered is, is how you anticipate the process of, of assessing the, the, the gas and the dust environment of a dynamically new comet from, for comet interceptor uh, after it's identified and before uh, you really want to know what the dust hazard is uh, for the flyby. Well, maybe I... Uh, actually, uh, the model we developed, uh, this engineering dust common model, uh, the main purpose of this model is uh, to provide some uh, uh, some uh, numbers for the industry to produce uh, protecting shield. And uh, uh, the requirement of uh, the industry, almost not of the industry, but of the uh, yes, but, oh, those who decide about the mission that the comet interceptor should survive in the conditions uh, close to condition uh, of Halle. So uh, we do not uh, consider um, absolutely any possible uh, sizes, for instance, of the nucleus, but um, most uh, probable, let's say. And uh, again, this model is for purely engineering purposes. For uh, science, uh, unfortunately, uh, well, I, I know that it is used now, but uh, I doubt that it can be really very, very useful because of very large uncertainty in the results. Mm -hmm. So uh, the work on uh, that model is continuing. So what I showed is, um, I mean, the model shown here, engineering dust common model of comet interceptor. Uh, this is a model for industry. Mostly. Okay. All right, thank you. You have more questions, Mike? No, not right now. I've I've been I've known Vladimir for a long time. I'm I'm well aware of all the work he's done since uh, 2001. So um, I don't have any further questions about the details. Okay. By the way, you are free, and this is true for all of you. You are free to jump on any question raised by someone else. To if you want to push that me back. All right, okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, Alessandra, you're next. Yeah, I, I actually have known Vladimir since so many years, and also in particular his work. We, I, I was lucky because I was often speaking about his work, 
and I had personal lectures <laughs> about uh, the work he was doing. So I have more comments than, than questions. And I think that Vladimir uh, performed his work really very accurately. He's always very critical with himself, maybe a bit too much. <laughs> and uh, and, and yeah, that's it. I think I, I appreciate it very much when he was in our group working and I, he, he brought uh, a lot of knowledge on, on this field. And as I said, he was always, uh, I, I wrote actually, uh, in my report, he was always very much available to explain his work, which is not easy, but he, he could do it quite, I mean, he, make it, he made it easy in any case. And then only the funny things, I only want to specify the reason why we went so often together to the police station is not because Vladimir was doing bad things, but it was, was just for documents because he wrote it on the acknowledgement. So I want to, to, to make it clear. And that was all for me. Okay, not, not the least question. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Alessandra. So, third reviewer is uh, Francois Leblanc. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so, probably I'm, I'm the most, let's say, uh, adapted to appreciate your, your presentation because I'm the less familiar with commentary science and I really appreciate your, the way you present it uh, more because I, I do like learn a lot of things in the interview. Uh, and actually, I have some questions because I'm not uh, completely aware about all this work you have done. Uh, my first question was related to one of your slides, but I, I don't remember the number of your slides, but it was related to the work you did preparing the PDA uh, on that. I saw your the distribution of, of the CO2 you derived or the, or the flux, maybe. Yes, now the, the previous one. Uh, this one? Oh, yes, this one. I was surprised why the, the CO2, uh, in particular, because I'm working, as you know, we are working on CO2 on some other objects. So uh, I was wondering why a CO2 is speaking at the, uh, the most, uh, at so, so particular place in your, in this derived derivation you did. Do you have any explanation why you, I mean, if I'm well understood, if you have your plot on your, on your right? The CO2 abundance seems to be in the, how would you say, the corner, the top. Uh, yes, yes, uh, I understand. Well, uh, first, uh, the which was shown here, the same kind of work, uh, practically the same set of data, uh, was done by. Uh, and uh, each group said that we got a good fitting to observational data. But if you look on the derived information of the surface, they are all different. And uh, this means uh, probably first that uh, solution is not unique. This would be uh, the most painful. Uh, but, uh, yes, well, I do not have right now this slide, but uh, as far as I remember, when I compared, uh, it was three or four uh, distributions, and uh, there are no clear uh, favorite. I would say that. We are so different all that uh, it's not possible to say that uh, it's more likely this because uh, two, two groups, for instance, found more or less safe. And uh, what, what I uh, would like to know, as far as I know, uh, other groups who, do, who made derivation of surface imagery, they used uh, uh, as, uh, they made this derivation in a way that uh, they changed some uh, a bit parameters, made simulation compared with observational results better 
then we go in the right direction. Plus, a little back and go in another direction. So, uh, this is the classic rule. But in this case, uh, they had to uh, divide the surface on some more or less uh, large regions because number of regions defines number of uh, parameters for variation. I developed uh, um, a regional procedure uh, which uh, do not use this, uh, this uh, approach. And in my case, uh, the surface is divided uh, if compared. I mean, uh, I use completely different way, but if to how say to uh, to make some similarity, uh, in my case, I have more than seven thousand uh, patches on the surface for which I make adjustment. So this can uh, uh, this can uh, result in a very uh, uh, dispersed. Yeah, <clears throat> but my question was, uh, I mean, since that in, uh, so I don't know what to call that, uh, the valley? Uh, the neck. The neck. The neck. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, you, you don't find that, you, I mean, I guess that what you see at your uh, distance does not depend on what is it. Something is coming from the neck. Is it the way I should understand your CO2 block? Your... Uh, well, this, uh, um... Uh, well, uh, let's say that um, if uh, the surface would be completely of the same color, mm -hmm. it means that uh, for the same temperature, we have the same flux. And uh, if uh, we take this plot, it means that uh, uh, for blue and red, uh, the difference in 10 times. Uh, so, um, it's an additional factor uh, which uh, increase or decrease uh, flux, uh, which is predicted by a simple uh, model of uh, either sublimation or diffusion from the surface. So you're right that uh, red parts, it's a uh, larger flux. <coughs> okay. If we have the same elimination conditions. Okay. So uh, if it is cold, uh, there is no flux in Yes, yes, yes. I, I imagine so. But I mean, but my, my original question was why CO2 would be more denser at this particular plate than at the neck. But maybe it's not. It's not but, uh, well, this is just a numerical yeah. result. Uh, <coughs> really so, so, I mean, following this question, I mean, uh, I was very interested by your, your work about the effect of cavities on, on the flux. My, my question was, okay, you, you consider one scale, just, I mean, one, I mean, my, my, my basic question is that looking to the real, let's say, uh, nucleus, you have many scales that you have to, so what is the smallest scale that you should consider? I mean, you have, you have a cavity which is at the, basically at the scale of the, of the nucleus itself, but at the smaller scales, you should have a lot of small cavities that should impact also your... Um, yes, I think I uh, understand. So, uh, well, of course, this effect uh, can't be easily scaled because uh, when, uh, for instance, here, when we have uh, external flow which close the exit from the cavity, this flow is uh, rather dense. If uh, we take a much smaller cavity, uh, most likely the mean free pass of the molecule yeah. will be larger, so it will leave it. <coughs> uh, but uh, so uh, this uh, this size of the cavity uh, when this effect could uh, here uh, is connected with the mean free pass. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> on that, on that. Excuse me, could I just yeah. ask, is it, would it be better to, to describe that really in terms of Knudsen number with relation to the topography of, that you're considering? So you, in, you, look at the, you look at the mean free path in relation to the size of the structure as an effective Knudsen number. 
Yes, I think this is the right one. Yeah. Just a decision. But, uh, uh, well, <laughs> in some sense, uh, um, well, uh, uh, I, uh, I'm a student of two teachers, Lieutenant and Brief. And the difference in their approach to such kind of problems was that for Lieutenant, every commentary nucleus was just a source. And uh, he preferred to use the source of the radius one. For Jean Francois Griffon, every sphere was in some sense comet. <laughs> That's why in our works, uh, we never had sphere of size one. We always have a sphere of size 1.7 uh, kilometer. Uh, or, well, and, uh, so I was in between. So in my book, uh, even in the text, you can notice that sometimes I say, Nucleus, sometimes I say source. So it's just a uh, big shock to approach. And what you say, this is more uh, like Luciana. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Not sure whether I should be pleased about that or not, but I. Uh, <laughs> but he was. Uh, uh, he was uh, no, in grief, I would say. Very well. They were both bright scientists. <laughs> and I have a very last question. So um, I was looking to your Ceres uh, work, and I was wondering: did you did you uh, use a defined rotational temperature for this work, or how did it work? Uh, so uh, yes. So we had. Uh, distribution of fluxes over the surface. Then I did uh, uh, normal uh, direct simulations with uh, Larsen Barnacki model for translational rotational energy exchange. And uh, after that, uh, I forget about the mass. So, I, as a result of my DCMC simulation, I have uh, density distribution, velocity distribution. And uh, temperature. Okay. Then, in this gas uh, uh, atmosphere, I uh, did relative transfer, uh, which uh, gave me uh, level, level populations for um, uh, all the seven levels. And uh, then, uh, having uh, densities, velocities, temperatures, and level populations, I uh, made simulations in line spectrum. Okay. The okay. So is, this is not completely consistent model, but uh, at that time it was the best one. Thank you. <coughs> Emmanuel, I'm done. Okay, thanks, Francois. So we proceed now maybe with uh, Jessica. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, in your thesis, you mentioned that there can be shock regions in the coma. And I was wondering, how would they be observable to, for instance, Rosetta, and have they been observed, either in the gas or in the dust? Would dust accumulate in this region, so you would have something like that looks like a jet? Or would not really, really do anything to dust? I don't know. Well, unfortunately, I removed this slide at the last moment. For instance, I was then, um, mm -hmm. in fact, if you remember, there was a famous uh, image with water, uh, uh, ice, and so on. And uh, in the neck uh, of Hartmutu, uh, we had enchantment. And uh, I think this is a uh, visible uh, presence of uh, the shock here, because gas from the uh, illuminated uh, low flows uh, to the neck and uh, meet another. Flux and here appears the shot. Uh, but 
we can see a really strong shock only uh, shock wave only uh, if production is uh, rather strong. Uh, and I think that in this sense, uh, 67 key was not a very good example because it was exactly chosen not to have too much gas production. <laughs> As for the dust, uh, well, as uh, was shown in this uh, pedagogical examples, yeah. so uh, what you can see, uh, the shocks in the gas, we see about 45 degree on the density and on the small dust, we can uh, notice this shock. So we see here some uh, uh, large increase of density. But uh, this is the same common, just other side of the dust. What we see here is absolutely unconnected with what we see in the glass. So, uh, and what we see in our images, it's a composition of <laughs> So uh, to see the shocks, I think uh, uh, we should somehow to separate small sizes. I mean, uh, information from small size to dust. If we have uh, large grains, uh, most likely uh, they do not depend on information. Can I ask another one? Sure, sure. Um, that is not related to this, but to series as well. Because um, after the water was discovered, so at the time when the water was discovered, series was only known from Hubble images. And there you have this Piazzi and the region A. And later on, the Dawn spacecraft went there. So has this been reinterpreted? I mean, have the sources, source regions of water been identified as some special features on the surface? I, I just didn't follow. Unfortunately, so, yeah. um, I'm asking about that. I don't know. Yeah, it's just something is that uh, the region is the to the the uh, Okatov uh, right region, volcanoes. Okay. Yeah. So that's this. Um, and, the, and water ice was yeah. found uh, by spectroscopy in this uh, region, as well as some A's. So it's the fire volcano. I see. See, <laughs> 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 Yeah, I've got a couple of questions first that I'd like to ask. Um, as you know, I'm, Vladimir, I'm sure you know, I'm going to admire what you do, but I really think you do great stuff. Um, and so I, I, I was very interested in, in your plans for the future. I just wanted to, to ask you a few questions about that more than anything else. Um, the first thing, I, I, there's been some attempts, I think, to look at combining Navier-Stokes and DSMC into a, a sort of having a coupled model where you address um, the high density uh, areas, uh, high density flows, in, in order to get away from the problem that you have with DSMC with, with fine grid and which is, you know, which is the computing time. Um, What's your feeling about that? Is that um, uh, I, I've seen some codes recently that have been proposing this or looking at this. What, what do you feel would, is 
with respect to commentary research and things like Comet Interceptor for the future, do you see an advantage in going down that route? Or oh. is this a problem of combining uh, fluid method with uh, kinetic? Uh, well, it has a very, very long story since the uh, 90s. Then uh, this issue starts to appear more and more often. And the uh, uh, problem is that, uh, one of the problems, that uh, uh, this issue is statistical. So it means uh, it's not very sensitive to small. Uh, uh, and uh, this is not. It means that. Uh, so when we pass parameters from Navier stocks to ACMC, well, uh, that's fine. But when we have some uh, back uh, from the ACMC uh, to fluid, I mean, at the same, if we solve it at the same uh, simultaneously, then these small perturbations uh, that is just statistical error, a statistical scatter, scatter sorry, yeah. in the ACMC, it provokes problem in uh, fluid method because it's uh, some uh, perturbation. Right. And uh, of course, people propose some uh, ways how to solve this, but uh, this method has to be even more complicated and take more time than just to compute either Monte Carlo from very beginning or uh, well, uh, interesting thing, I did not show this unfortunately here, that uh, even Euler solutions, which are less uh, precise from physical point of view than Navier stocks, they produce very good predictions, uh, yeah. for instance, for Azina data. And uh, I think that if we do not need super precise uh, description of the flow, uh, crossing of Navier stocks and the SMC doesn't do Okay. It's, it's, it's interesting from a computational point of view, yeah. from mathematical simulation, but uh, if we do not know precisely uh, boundary conditions. In some ways, it's a solution looking for a problem, is yes. what you're saying. Kind of. <laughs> And, and this was the, I think this leads on to the second question that I have, which is really about the precision that you, that, that, um, I know in, in discussing with some of other people connect in, in, with respect to DSMC that there's, there are limits to how accurately the, the, the computational result is. Um, what do you feel is the, 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 the accuracy that you get with your, with your implementation? And what do you think is enough? How accurate is enough in the cases for comments? Uh, well, at the beginning of my work uh, with Krifo and Radionov, uh, we always start from uh, the case uh, that would be uh, computed by Navier Stokes and uh, the yeah. SMC. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, well, First, of course, we check that uh, we have a perfect agreement in uh, when the both methods are valid. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this takes a lot of time. For, us. Uh, for the precision, uh, uh, fine precision is, a result, uh, is um, defined by several factors. First, how would we know? Uh, boundary conditions, for instance, but also how would we know even physical properties of uh, the medium? Because for uh, even for water, for the temperatures uh, above 100 K, well, we have quite a lot of experimental data. For low, uh, low temperatures, even for viscosity, data are not very uh, solid, I would say. 
not saying uh, about uh, relative transfer <laughs> when uh, it's even not not even the, the number is not clear, but uh, how this energy enters is <laughs> unclear. So uh, super precise uh, results, I think. Uh, Simply, uh, we, we can't uh, understand uh, the advantage. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you, when you talked about perfect agreement between DSMC and, and, and Navier Stokes, I can still remember this paper that Crefo published where he made the comparison. And he said that, that, that fundamentally it was it, it's impossible because the, the you know, because of the descriptions, you know, you've got viscosity and, and, and conductivity in the Navier Stokes um, terms, and inside DSMC you've got the collision properties. And how you know to, to be able to make them agree perfectly, you have to have perfect descriptions of of those properties on both sides of the, on, on both conditions. And so I, I, when you said perfect before, what did you mean by that? Perfect, it means that um, uh, we have, uh, we had um, a region of, uh, have some criterion of convergency, right? And uh, when uh, my results, uh, DCMC results, uh, differ less than three yeah. percent in this case. Okay. It was for us perfect. Okay, but uh, yes, true that uh, really perfect. But uh, again, uh, another problem was that when we compared uh, Navier Stokes and the and the ACC, uh, in commentary context, even a postulation of boundary conditions is very much. Because uh, for the SMC, uh, let's say we say uh, we postulate some uh, distribution function, called Maxwellian, for instance. In uh, the SMC, in uh, the stocks, Krifo uh, and Radionov propose some procedure uh, which give parameters on the top of the constant layer. And that's why in our model, when we compare with region, first he made his simulations. Uh, and then I used, uh, and, uh, even more complicated, he made simulations which affect the boundary condition because uh, flux depends on the, uh, on the Mach number. Right. And uh, that was a feature of uh, what is called the model of uh, reform on the surface. Uh, because uh, uh, ambient uh, gas environment affects on the flux. So, Region of made uh, calculations. I took his resulting uh, boundary conditions. So it's uh, well, uh, comparison is uh, correct, but uh, without that stocks, I would not use these conditions. Mm -hmm. Simply, I, I would not be able to get them. I would use normal uh, of maximum distribution. So uh, the fact that we had a very good agreement, first because cases were selected when they should be, I mean, when we wanted. You cherry picked it. And second, uh, uh, because uh, we correctly uh, used uh, exactly the same boundary condition. So it's not simply Nadia stocks someone and then independently I do basics. It was always uh, dependent. Yeah, I, I, I fully understand. I think it's, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I get, I get why you had to do that. It's, it's, it's very challenging, and that brings me, if I might, to sure. I'm not sure, sure. thanks to, uh, you know, to the to the boundary conditions as well. But, but, uh, you, you you say that what you would like to do in the future is also to look at the initial boundary conditions and how that can be done more. Uh, I. I how do you envisage what are the things that you would like to be, what, what are the things that are interesting you first in, in, in that? Um, you know, it, it's clear that one can have a, um, 
uh, sand heat balance at the surface. And, but uh, what I think we've learned from Rosetta is that the situation is, is more complicated even than just a flat surface with a, with a heat transfer function. Do, do, what, do you, what do you envisage about trying, what do you envisage in trying and taking a look at? Well, well, here there are several parts because even without yeah. uh, thermal modeling, the fact that surface is not flat, uh, already, uh, uh, well, actually, I submitted a paper uh, two years ago about it, mm -hmm. but uh, then we decided not to continue. The idea was that uh, uh, for instance, we have a shape model uh, with very fine resolution, excessively fine. We can't use so resolution. Then we degradate the shape to the number of surface elements that we can treat. And at this moment, we assume that uh, triangle of these surface elements are homogeneous. But in reality, they are not homogeneous. And is it correct simply to uh, postulate that all these surface elements are homogeneous? And that was the subject of uh, that uh, study, unfortunately not finished yet. And in addition to this, uh, next step, because this is uh, uh, was very simple. We just postulate flux, but surface is not homogeneous on a small scale. And is it possible to find a way how to uh, represent it in effective parameters? And the next step uh, here is to include thermal model. It was, uh, it also will play a role. So, uh, first I plan to finish this <laughs> okay. And then, uh, in parallel, I already started working on thermal model. Uh, if I look at time. And for me, a really very, very interesting thing is uh, uh, erosion of the surface, yeah. which uh, may be uh, of many reasons, uh, not only simply a lot of uh, high pressure, but also thermal uh, effects due to expansion. expansion. Yeah. So, so, so all these things are about <laughs> I think one of the things that's well, you know, in, in, that, that, we, that, that I've been looking at is the question of porosity and the influence on the gas temperature. And um, I, I think this is quite a, a challenge to model. And I was just wondering if you were, if you were also thinking about similar, similar problems because of, the, because of the gas temperature, because of the influence on the gas temperature. Well, uh, I saw the paper about <laughs> Yeah. And that was very interesting. That's a big view for me to think. <laughs> sure, that's your fault. Okay. So, this is a really uh, interesting problem. And, uh, uh, well, uh, small steps I start to do this correctly. But, uh, well, no time, unfortunately. <laughs> I understand. But uh, I see that a lot of uh, people uh, uh, now start to uh, try to understand how dust uh, can be ejected from the surface. Because this simple model, our assumption that it is simply uh, taken by gas, first, what gas if it is on the surface? <laughs> Second, uh, uh, unlikely that it is completely not attached to the surface. Okay, that was a, one of my questions that I didn't ask. But when you do this simulation, how, how important is the assumption that you take on your on this first release for the gas? Well, actually, uh, this is another thing that can be analyzed. Uh, uh, this dimensionless things. Uh, like the, in uh, this, uh, 
Sandra is stand from, <laughs> we made a paper uh, on that. And one of the parts um, uh, was devoted to the case when dust grain is ejected with some velocity from the surface. And the question is that in some cases, it keeps the same velocity all the way. So it does not care about the envi environment. It is ejected with some velocity and it keeps it. Then, in another situation, uh, this grain is ejected with some velocity and then decelerated in the coma. Even not accelerated, but decelerated. And of course, another case when it is ejected with some velocity, but at a few radius of the nucleus, uh, there is no difference between grain which was not ejected, uh, with, was ejected with zero velocity and with. And this was described with these uh, dimensionless parameters. And um, which uh, allows us to say if gas production from the surface of this level, uh, we may not care about uh, initial velocity of grains. And uh, of course, uh, we presented results that uh, show that this grain keeps completely initial velocity, forget completely initial velocity. And uh, something should be seen. A couple of questions on, but I, I, I let somebody else have a go for a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> uh, Paul, next. <clears throat> uh, coming to this uh, <clears throat> observation, so the dust, so you say the initial velocity uh, of the dust grain is caused by a different physical process than the interaction with the gas grain. Or what is the reason for that? So the initial, I mean, you left away the initial uh, velocity of the dust particles, and so that means the physical process that ejected the dust particle is uh, maybe a different one than experienced in the coma and the same with the gas, or maybe sublimating ice or whatever. So, or what, what is the reason? What do you think? Oh, uh, uh, a lot of um, Works uh, on dust ejection assume that no, uh, assume that there is some uh, cavity under the particle uh, with high pressure, which at some moment uh, ejected. Uh, if this is uh, for a single particle, so this is a very small uh, volume, and unlikely that uh, it can it has enough energy to accelerate. If uh, the is large, then uh, there are two questions. First, uh, if it's really large, like uh, on the scale of a centimeter, then we know that uh, temperature drops a lot. So how we can get high temperature uh, in, on, this, on this depth? And second, when uh, this cavity opens. The gas uh, which is inside this cavity should go in all directions. And dust also should not go just straight. So we always should see some kind of uh, plum of gas and uh, does the same. And that's what surprised me a lot uh, in uh, images, uh, what we see in uh, Rosetta. Uh, we see that dust motion is rather uh, very collimated, or well, maybe not collimated, but it's not uh, diverging. So, uh, uh, for me, it means that uh, ejection was not a process of explosion. It was some kind of uh, like you know shooting from the gun, <laughs> and uh, how to physically. Uh, then I have another question. So if you look at the gas environment uh, around the comet, you have also got, uh, you have, uh, let's say, energy momentum um, that's flowing back to the surface, right? And um, so what about the processes, the processes uh, causing this, let's say, this uh, the subsonic and sonic Areas is it is the same? Is it different? Is it interaction with that? Let's say the sonic or the supersonic? Is it possible with the supersonic 
to get the uh, yeah, uh, let's say energy like flowing back and how does it work? Uh, well, for the gas, uh, well, for the gas, uh, uh, if again, if we uh, assume that it is uh, well, but. Actually, no need to assume that. Anyway, if it was sublimating from the surface or so diffusion from the surface uh, in the first, uh, in the immediate vicinity to the surface, it anyway, uh, even if it was released from some pores with supersonic velocity, it will become uh, subsonic because of interaction with uh, adjacent uh, environment. And the thickness of this uh, subsonic layer. Uh, is uh, uh, well, depends on the characteristic scale of the surface. For instance, if it is a sphere, it's uh, uh, from uh, from uh, just a second uh, from uh, let's see, either one percent of the radius. Uh, it's always subsonic, and uh, up to uh, I do not remember the, exactly the number, but kind of twelve percent, something like that. So, uh, uh, think is that uh, if we have supersonic flows, they any interaction uh, uh, leads to appearance of shocks. In the shock, we have deceleration, we have increase of temperature and density. And uh, that's why from an homogeneous surface on the small scale, even if uh, the expansion was supersonic, then it becomes again subsonic. But then it accelerates. And uh, we have a supersonic flow. And with the gas, this is uh, more or less, uh, if it's a pure gas, it's more or less simple. Uh, if we have presence of dust, uh, first of all, presence of dust makes the uh, subsonic region much larger because uh, uh, it's not only, uh, again, uh, here uh, there are several processes. One simple momentum exchange between gas and dust, and second, a more uh, complicated process is in exchange of energy. Dust can be hotter and uh, heat uh, the gas, which make it uh, slower. It's uh, more energetic, but uh, subsonic. So, uh, and that's why uh, it is interesting to consider flows uh, with the back influence of dust on the gas. Uh, so, anyway, uh, subsonic region can't be very uh, large in cometary case. Uh, but uh, the thickness of this subsonic layer is very important because uh, in, a subs uh, in subsonic layers there are no structures like shock waves. They uh, simply they do not form this. But, and that's why uh, if surface is very uh, complicated, very rough, We do not see so many shocks because they all dissipated before in, the, in this mixing layer. So, so well, uh, this needs <laughs> complicated uh, models. Okay. One, one last question. Now, imagine in the far future we have an instrument like Miro, but not with one pixel, but let's say like a camera with many, many pixels. And now you want to see from the coma, you can measure velocities, maybe temperature density. Um, you want to see what are the sources of the gas on the surface of the comet. Trace back, so to speak, the sources. So maybe as you just mentioned before, the cavities that may lift dust, which may not happen or not, you get spoons or, or some, some narrow cones and all this. And the problem is, from my understanding, is if you're very far away, you cannot say because it's all mixed out. It's 
but then uh, and also everything would be dark, so to speak, optically thick because the production rate is, is, is high enough. You just uh, can't see very far. But at some point, you come nearer and nearer and nearer. And you now the question is, how near do you have to go that you can distinguish between? I, I can imagine that if you have all these different processes creating gas, which flow in all different directions, all different shapes, it may be difficult to, to uh, let's say, even if from 10 kilometer distance, where the gas comes from, right? And so how far do you have to go to the comet? And does it depend on the heliocentric distance, the production rate? Would you observe all the three isotopes? What would you do? Very simple. You should go down until we stick to the surface. Okay. <laughs> In this case, we are not sure that uh, how it works. Yeah, unfortunately, this is very expensive. You can't see the whole comet. Yeah, but uh, unfortunately, this is very expensive. <laughs> yeah. No, no, but uh, I, mean, I mean, would it help to go to large heliocentric distances? Well, also this is, uh, in some sense, when we have a very uh, high production rate, we can uh, notice better uh, the features of gas production, simply more visible. But at the same time, uh, uh, the structure, because of these uh, different interactions, is much more complicated. If we go, uh, if we take situation with very low gas production, uh, we see nothing. Uh, so, uh, right now I can't say what is the optimal. <laughs> and I think that the uh, uh, idea of what was uh, used in Rosetta was rather correct to follow uh, in different conditions uh, to, to observe the surface for a long period. Unfortunately, well, the place of observation was maybe not ideal, especially for in-situ observations when uh, we are close to termination, where uh, flow was already quite uh, complicated. Well, I, I, well, uh, for the moment, I, I do not see any uh, other solution than to go again to the surface and see. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. So, first, uh, thank you, Vladimir. I like your presentation. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I want to say first that uh, Vladimir, of, in fact, he spent many years uh, here uh, at the observatory of uh, Paris in our uh, comet team, either working uh, uh, with, with us, with our project, with us, like uh, the radiative transfer to, to interpret those stress uh, observations, water, or serious observations, for example, but he was also. Uh, in fact, uh, the host in our team during several years because he, he was working with Jean Francois Foucault, in fact. And uh, during all this period, in fact, uh, Vladimir was always uh, available to, to help uh, me, Nicola, and Jack to answer to our question about this physics of the gas coma. And uh, we learned a lot, I think, we learned more. From him that uh, he learned from us. Uh, and uh, also, I want to, to thank Vladimir uh, for my students, uh, also uh, very uh, available to, to follow them on a uh, specific topic where uh, he was much more uh, expert than me. For that. So now I have a three questions, three questions which are more related to, to, to observations. Uh, but the first one, the first one is about uh, something, a process which is not included in your model. It's the sublimation of the grains. And uh, I would like to know, uh, because we know that this process is occurring in the common. And so uh, how it would affect your uh, uh, the, the, the physics. Well, first, uh, distributed sources are uh, complicated, so <laughs> much, much more. Especially because uh, what, what is the problem? 
problem that uh, we have this uh, sublimation from uh, uh, from grains of different size and uh, motion of uh, these different uh, grains of different size have a very different time scales. That's what we uh, did with Adeline. Uh, with Adeline, uh, we simplified the problem assuming that uh, products of sublimation from grains uh, do not affect uh, in general on the general flow. And this is rather strong assumption. So, um, uh, first, if we have distributed sources, this uh, can uh, change velocity of the flow, density of course. Uh, well, uh, then the question is uh, how would uh, how, uh, how precisely to treat all this process because then it's also so we have exchange of mass. We will have exchange with momentum, then we have an additional exchange of energy. And already this is too uh, much. But well, uh, so, okay. another question is about uh, Rosetta. Rosetta, we will uh, Landed on the surface, and I remember that uh, uh, the, the PI of the instrument of Bor Rosetta were fighting to get the time at the very last moment of Rosetta. So there were, for example, the last image of Osiris, etc. And but also the PI of Rosina asked for observations, measurement with the Rosina uh, until the end. Arguing that this will, uh, we will understand a lot of things with uh, those observations, so I would like to. <laughs> but uh, uh, if you know what was done with those data, and if it would be interesting to, to use it. Unfortunately, uh, <laughs> Why, University of Bern, you're looking at me. Because <laughs> <laughs> you are close. <laughs> No, but, uh, well, you are not in the world. This is 2016, right? Yeah. And at yeah. this time, I was on Mars already. On Mars already. Because I left comments in 2015, and uh, for three years, I was purely on Mars, and then uh, additionally two years. But so, do you think because uh, uh, it's just a, do you think it would be a, uh, can well, say something because uh, I don't know. for sure uh, closer to the surface of any uh, institute data uh, are very interesting of course yeah, no, you, you are on yeah, no, we had the site which was no dust. I think that uh, closer to the uh, close to the surface we get uh, uh, maybe not more the results but uh, this results easier to interpret but uh, if we talk about uh, pressure for instance for composition uh, I can't imagine what we can find uh, different from what we got in the common. I mean, uh, the numbers are different, but uh, what else? No, maybe current species, molecules, this is, that disintegrate very quickly. Well, but then the question is that uh, this is a uh, one measure. Few measurement, what is the value of this? for my No, well, uh, that's, a, that's a thing that it's like with uh, for what I studied, it's so six comments. Uh, and uh, it's very poor statistics to say uh, something general, I mean, uh, something general based on this. And uh, the same is here. Yes, uh, this data are very interesting, of course, but. Uh, Easier to interpret, probably you see something new, but to repeat this date, to 
uh, if this was not some random event, this should be reproduced. How we can reproduce this? Um, my last question is about uh, the James Webb uh, telescope because, um, in fact, uh, several comets have been observed as well as the uh, centaurs. And uh, with James Webb, you, you can access both to water and CO2. And uh, in several of those comets, in fact, uh, the uh, the water distribution is very different from the CO2 uh, distribution. And also in one object, uh, which is uh, Chasson 1, uh, we see, uh, in fact, two, two jets of CO2, which are uh, at exactly 180 degrees separation. And, uh, and so the people, they, they are uh, uh, interpreting the, that with just conical jet, etc. And I, I would like to know if uh, modeling would uh, help to, to understand what, what, what we are observing other than uh, using uh, extremely simple description and uh, from that uh, deriving. Uh, the, 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 the simulation. Um, not only can help, but it's a uh, way not to make some uh, uh, very big errors because uh, this, uh, uh, how to say, application of uh, cones, uh, cylinders, and so on, is purely geometry. There is no uh, physics behind it, except the expression. <laughs> I personally uh, think that uh, it's possible to make physically, uh, not uh, necessarily very complex, but physically consistent uh, description. Uh, I well, If we uh, uh, basic physical laws, we can get very interesting results, but uh, no one uh, Yes, I think maybe considerations can, should, and uh, must help. Um, because the telescopes, they always see the very far corner. And the gas dynamics happens in a region that also James Webb probably cannot see. So is it, to which extent is it possible to lead the model of the inner coma to what we see in the telescope? I mean, 67P kind of also shows these jets that John Baptiste has observed. And is it possible to, to link that to source regions on the surface? Well, in, uh, in some situations, it's possible. Uh, in general, uh, I, I don't. You know, I don't. But, uh, but I know that uh, it, was, uh, it was easy group on that, right? Uh, yes. uh, so the, the idea was that uh, uh, to know uh, properties of inner coma to derive properties of the nucleus. Then we do the next step. We uh, try to connect outer coma with inner coma. So in principle, approach is uh, correct, but. Uh, the scale is very different, so I doubt that uh, in general uh, this is possible. In some particular cases, maybe. I think on, on the large uh, scales, you can only derive some uh, really integral properties. Okay, you want to add something, Nick, or uh, yeah, I, I, I just 
I wanted to come back to um, your effectively this, the, the, the equations that, um, that you've used for this, the way you've got your, your if, who, and well. Um, and, you know, the, these, the, the thing that you show also in your table when you have the cases one, two, and three is the question of redundancy. And the fact that, or oh, degeneracy, I should say, actually, degeneracy. Um, and it, when we're talking here about the, the other phenomena that can happen in the inner coma, we were talking there about sublimation, sublimation of grains, and also the, the, you know, the back coupling between the dust and the gas. Um, I think what you're, one of the things that you're showing, and I think we, you know, Mike as well in, in the work that he's done, and I think in, in other area, other groups as well, is the real problem that one has with the genus and the solutions. Um, do you see in 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 the development of these models? Um, do you believe that it's worthwhile us trying to look at ways in which we can find, you know, what are really the key measurements for breaking degeneracies? You know, using your model, using the models also to, to um, instead, of, instead of just saying, okay, I've now constructed this model, isn't it great, wonderful, right? Um, you, one uses models, I think, to try to learn something. Right? And isn't the way forward not to use the models to say, okay, I fit my data, but instead to look and see whether the, the idea is to see how do I break the degeneracy or to get the model to predict for me what is the measurement that I need for degeneracy to break the degeneracy. Well, this is uh, on my PM, basically, this is why I do this is <laughs> that's a uh, ideal uh, goal for this medical simulation mm -hmm. to predict something and then to verify this in experiments or uh, to define the most Simulations was shown this uh, was discovered this effect and then it was verified in uh, experiments. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe this kind of problems uh, they exist, but uh, well, I know only one for the moment. <laughs> but uh, this is the basic purpose of numerical simulation. But the, the thing is that when we're introducing, when you when you introduce now, I mean, I'm particularly interested in the in the dust gas. Feedback and, and, and this problem because I mean it's a really, it's a really challenging numerically it's very challenging to do this. Um, but could you do you envisage um, do you envisage going taking this sort of kind of step by step approach rather than trying to trying to model the whole the, the whole of that interaction because it's it, the number of free parameters then is is very large right. Uh, yes, uh, I think that uh, again, uh, I would 
would have to always move in uh, small steps in order not to miss some. Uh, also, on this step-by-step uh, uh, -step approach, uh, we can optimize uh, the uh, description. For instance, we can find some asymptotic uh, uh, asymptotics. Uh, and for which we do not need to make super uh, complicated numerical simulation. We just uh, take the asymptotical value and it uh, works very well. So, uh, again, in my practice, uh, when uh, I tried to solve a very complex problem from very beginning, uh, it's always finished. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike, do you want to add something before we conclude? Or uh, no, I'm I'm perfectly happy. It's very nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I will I will then uh, take the floor. Uh, so let me thank you for the presentation. I I learned a lot. Or rather, I should say I discovered a lot because learning means assimilating. I have not assimilated everything said because it's so new for me. But thank you, and thank you. It was very uh, interesting. And Vladimir didn't mention it in his presentation, but he has been working with Dominique and me for two years now on a very, on very big comets, uh, Gallimi and I, <laughs> where he's uh, developing non lt models uh, to interpret James Wade observations. And I think uh, Vladimir, uh, to one of uh, Dominic's question, answer, if necessary, we will do it. And I think that his uh, philosophy of work <laughs> is always uh, available to develop more complex and more physical models whenever needed. So I have one question, uh, Vladimir. Uh, so uh, you mentioned that uh, when you were working for for, for CNES, essentially, uh, for the mission profile of, uh, of Philae, uh, you were responsible for the kinetic model, and, and Alex, Alexander Aradionov yes, was responsible for the fluid part. And so I was wondering how, in practice, these models were used by the project. How did they modify the mission profile? And who won? I mean, where are your models used for? Radionov used uh, was that um, first um, uh, we uh, used a Radionov model because uh, it was much faster than this we uh, in time scales Radionov code to compute one rotation which consists of 75 positions it takes like two hours for the SMC it takes uh, a few days. And uh, that's why we used his code first to adjust uh, roughly to observational data. Then when we adjust uh, parameters on the surface, we use Monte Carlo to check. Uh, for Philae, we had only three months from first data to the last delivery. And uh, as far as I remember, uh, uh, well, uh, the thing was that CNES uh, sent us a file with grid, and for this grid, we have to provide uh, gas parameters. So, uh, and uh, then we made this exchange several times. So, I think we did like uh, five deliveries to CNES. And uh, yes, so uh, as I said, so uh, first, um, because Rajonov was too far, he gave me his code. So I made, uh, uh, I ran all these uh, simulations with his, with his code. Then uh, when we see, we think that the convergence is reached. Uh, I used his boundary conditions to run Monte Carlo, and uh, this data we provided to CNES. So yeah, my, my question is how was it used at, at Project Lido? At Project Lido with these tables of numbers? Oh, well, uh, say, uh, uh, 
also used kind of Monte Carlo method for trajectory assessment. So they released uh, uh, phi with different uh, velocity vectors. And uh, this uh, trajectory passed through the given gas environment computed by us. And then um, they estimate the ellipse uh, in which uh, most likely it will, uh, where it will more likely touch the surface. Okay. So in numbers, uh, uh, the ellipse was size, uh, ellipse size was 100 to 500 as far as I remember. And the uh, uh, final result that the uh, light touched the surface 108 meters from uh, the center of the ellipse. So, and uh, again, uh, fortunately for Philae and for us, that uh, coma was uh, rather verified. But uh, from what they uh, computed in class, uh, in some part of the coma, uh, in the largest part of the coma, ratio um, gravity to aerodynamics was like 20, uh, oh, sorry, gravity, yeah, gravity to aerodynamics. Uh, so gravity was 20 times uh, stronger than aerodynamics, so we made up here. But since uh, there were regions where it was close to one and sometimes greater than one. Vice versa. So I, I, what I want to say is that in most part, uh, gravity was stronger than aerodynamic, but still in some parts it was uh, uh, and uh, when it was larger than one, it means that feel like could be repulsed by the atmosphere. But even if it was less than one, uh, for instance, uh, fifty percent or ten percent, uh, we may have a very large uh, deviation of the trajectory. So uh, I can't say that because of our model, uh, lander successfully landed. This is not true. But at the same time, I can't say that without any model, <laughs> it will finish uh, successfully. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. OK, so I think uh, I will ask this audience to leave the room because we are going to stay here to keep in touch with this mic. So just wait in the corridor. <laughs> <laughs>